Okay, welcome back to the channel and in today's video I am answering your amazing questions but before I continue, if you want to learn about fashion more effectively, I've written an ebook about effective ways to learn about fashion and the link to that is in the description below. Definitely read it, I would definitely recommend it and without further ado, let's get straight into the video. So for those that don't know, on my Instagram I ask people to submit questions that I'm going to do on a YouTube Q&A and I do it from time to time. Um, so. I guess starting with the first question, which was a really good question, it is, was fashion better 30 plus years ago? In brackets, it has Style Revolution in Japan, Margiela, Antwerp 6. Now, like I said, this is a really good question, and this is something that I hear a lot. A lot of people say that, um, yeah, fashion was amazing, and fashion will never be the same, and I miss the era of, like, the couturiers, the original couturiers, and all that sort of stuff. And while I, I see where they're coming from, um, I don't agree with that at all. I think if, if we look at fashion, if we just start from like the times of like Charles James, there are probably people that thought that there was never going to be another Charles James, which there wasn't, but like there's never going to be a designer of that level and skill and talent, right? And then you have the era that was like the Coco Chanel's and the Elsa Scaparelli's and then you had the Cristobal Balenciaga, the Pierre Balmain, you had the Christian Dior's, then you had the Mary Quants. So over time, there's, there's always good designers. Like even if we think like 70s, 80s, 90s, we had that whole, like he was saying 30 plus years ago, we had, you know, Yoji Yamamoto, Issei Miyake, Reikau Kubo, um, and then if you just go further, then we had the Antwerp 6 and we had Jill Sander and we had Helmut Lang. And then I'm sure there's people who are like, oh, it's never going to be the same. And then we have like John Galliano, Alexander McQueen, Raph Simmons. Like, they're always amazing designers at any point in time. I don't think that the Chris Indios and El Scaparelli's, that's the last time we're going to see any amazing designer. Like, even in the current day, obviously, I know it's like a broken record. We talk about Demna Vasali a lot. But there are other designers, there's like J.W. Anderson, and there's like Rashimi Bottom, there's like Rick Owens, Emily Adams Bodie, um, Eddie Slimon, Phoebe Philo. There's so many good designers. Like, it's actually endless. And I think where that belief system that, um, you know, fashion was better 30 plus years ago and fashion of the past was always better and oh I missed the times of Vivian Westwood and the punks. I think where that comes from is because now most people only look at what the big brands are doing. People don't actually look at like who are the brands that are coming up. People don't take time to actually learn about all the new brands. People always just every single season they talk about the main like the Gucci's and the Dior's and the Balenciaga's and the Loewe's. Like, no one really cares about the new designers. So from that perspective, it makes sense that people will think that fashion isn't the same. But I think that we should be looking at newer designers. And I'll tell you, I'll prove to you that people don't want to learn about new designers. So on my channel, I know it doesn't get views when I talk about new designers because people, once again, don't care about new designers. So I have a series on my channel called Who Is? And I've done episodes on Louise Trotter who's the creative director of Lacoste, and I really like her work. Um, I've done one on Barbara Sanchez Kane, a Mexican designer. I've done one on Isabel Benenato, Italian designer. I've done one on Paria Fazane. I've done one on... I recently did an episode on Simone Rocha. And the episode I did on Simone Rocha really recently, it literally got 2,000 views. 2,000 views. And then... The video after, I did a review on the Balenciaga Haute Couture collection and then that got like almost, it's almost at 40,000 views now. So that just shows you that people do not want to learn about the brands that are actually doing interesting things. People just want to know what Balenciaga did every single season. And then the same people complain and say that like, obviously I'm not saying the person that asked this question, I'm just saying in general the same people complain that, oh... Fashion is not the same as it was 30 plus years ago, but there are so many designers now that are amazing, like Kane and Amiya, Uma Wang, um, Tebe Mugugu, Tokyo James, like, they're, they're, I know I said butter. These are designers that actually have something very serious to say. Their work is so interesting. It's not like super, super commercial, like what we see the major brands doing. And what people need to understand about like 
Balenciaga or Dior or whatever, is bear in mind that these brands, so let's say Balenciaga that was started by Cristobal Balenciaga. Cristobal Balenciaga was like a master tailor. It doesn't matter who's the creative director of Balenciaga. They're never going to be as good as Cristobal Balenciaga. It's just like Alexander McQueen. Like, it's the same thing. Like, people are so critical about Sarah Burton, but I just think it's that Sarah Burton is never going to fill the shoes of Alexander McQueen. It's just never going to happen. Which is why I'm always interested in people that start their own brands. I'm interested in creative directors at brands because obviously you had designers like John Galliano who's done really cool stuff everywhere he's been, like Margiela, Dior, Givenchy. It's just that designers that start their brands are normally more passionate. They have a specific vision. They have like a very new point of view. And so that's why I'm always looking at, you know, the likes of the Uma Wangs and the Tokyo James and the Tebe Magugus and the Bodies and all these type of brands because they actually have a very, the Rushemi Butters, they have such an interesting point of view and their brands are so interesting. And the stuff they're doing is so interesting, it's so fresh. Their point of view on things is so fresh. But people will just say that, oh, fashion is not the same because you're only looking at like what Valentino and Balenciaga and Versace is doing on the runway. You're not looking at all these newer brands that are coming up, you know, even like the LVMH prize, like, no one really talks about the LVMH Prize and the brands like Tokyo James and SS Daily and ERL. Like, that's what I'm saying. People don't really <laughs> look into what's propping up, what's coming up. It's just about the established brand. So, no, I can never agree that uh, fashion is, like, getting worse or it's not as good. If you look at through time, even, like, I remember I was reading Dan Evreeland's writing and her diaries and stuff, and when she's describing, like, the time she was in and describing like when Dior's new look came through and Carmel Snow who was obviously in charge of Harper's Bazaar at the time and Diana Vedan was talking about how obviously she coined the new look and all that sort of stuff and then she's talking about like how amazing um, Dior's clothing was for the time even though she didn't personally like it she preferred Chanel's clothing but the way, like, when you read about all these times, the way people are talking about Kristen Dior is like, there will never, never be a, a designer close to this level again. And then shortly after, Yves Saint Laurent comes around. And Yves Saint Laurent, even Kristen Dior himself, talks about how amazing Yves Saint Laurent was. And Yves Saint Laurent designed so many of Kristen Dior's looks when Kristen Dior was there, literally. So... Yeah, this idea that, you know, there's never going to be another one and then next thing Issa Laurent and Karl Lagerfeld come around, it's just like... And I think another thing that causes this sort of mentality is the fact that we never understand what we're living through until we look at things in hindsight. So I remember reading about, and people have told me this, like people that know Alexander McQueen and were really involved in fashion and big journalists around the time when Alexander McQueen was obviously making his mark. So many people didn't even understand his work. They were so critical of it. Obviously, everyone knows about the bumpsters and the story around that. But that happened all the time. There are so many people that didn't understand Alexander McQueen's work. And they were just like, he's not even that good. He's overrated. There were so many journalists that said that. There's so many articles and reviews you can read about that. And now that we're looking at it in hindsight, we're like, oh my God, this guy's a genius. So I think so many designers that we have now... We don't really appreciate their greatness because we're not looking at it in hindsight. And I think, I don't, I'm not like wishing for people to die, obviously not, but I'm saying that I feel like after people die or like after people quit fashion, then people will have time to, you know, think about what someone has actually done and be like, oh, this was actually amazing. I think in hindsight, a lot of designers now that people don't really see in a high light, whether we're talking about Demna Vassali or J.W. Anderson, I think is someone that in hindsight, we're gonna like see J.W. Anderson as a way better designer than people view Jonathan Anderson now, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's my long-winded answer to that question. The next question is, how did my fashion journey start? And now I've actually made um, a video, so many videos at this point about how I started in fashion. There's one video that, I think is about my first internship. You can like search it up. I did talk about how I got into that first internship, but essentially that first internship, which was at a women's wear brand called Deploy London, was what 
introduced me to everything in fashion. Before I did that internship, I didn't really know that much about fashion. I was just interested in it from like a style perspective, not necessarily an industry perspective. And then when I was there, I learned how to make patterns and I learned what pattern making is. I learned about sewing, I learned logistics, I learned about shipping, I learned about fabrics, textures, product testing, everything. I learned it all there. And then after Deploy London, I went to, I worked at Stella McCartney for a bit. And then after I worked at Stella McCartney, I worked at a company called Carmel Global, which is one of the biggest suppliers of fashion in Europe. And then after I worked there, I went to CSM, which I am right now and I study fashion journalism at CSM. So that's kind of been my progression, really. But yeah, you just have to watch that internship video where I talk about how I sort of stumbled across fashion by mistake and got into that internship by chance, um, but yeah. Now this question is, in your opinion, which designer community is most toxic? Now, I don't know if you mean this in terms of like fashion community as a whole or what specific designers community is the most toxic. Now, I think in fashion, there are toxic communities regardless of where you look. If you look at the sneaker community, very toxic. If you look at the high-end designer community, extremely toxic. If you look at the... <laughs> it's, it's, I sound like a pessimist. This is hilarious. Um, any other community, if you look at the streetwear community, not only is it very toxic, some of it is even sexist and parts of it even homophobic. So I think there are many different aspects um, of fashion that are really toxic and obviously so many aspects that are nice. But if you're asking me what designer breeds the most toxic um, community, I would say Rick Owens. That's from personal experience. It could be a different designer, but from what I've experienced and what I see, I definitely think the communities formed around Rick Owens are the most toxic communities I've ever seen in my life. Like, they are so bad. And it's sad because Rick Owens is, like, a designer I really respect. I really like Rick Owens' work. It's just the people that support Rick Owens and the community, all these weirdos that call him dad and stuff. They, they act like Rick Owens is literally their dad that they must protect at all costs and Rick Owens can never do anything wrong and no constructive criticism can ever be sent at Rick Owens' way otherwise you have to die. It's like that extreme. Like there are ex super weirdos that are sort of fanboys of Rick Owens and it's just such a toxic community that's formed around Rick Owens, definitely. So I think of any brand, I don't think there's a toxic community on the level of Rick Owens, for sure. This next question is, I'm struggling to appreciate my own work even after putting my all into it. Thoughts? Um, I think this is a struggle that we all go through. I think that there are many times, regardless of what industry you're working in, that will create work and we just feel like it's not good enough. But I think the, the good point of view to have is that whatever you work on, there are skills you need to learn and work on to even create any piece of work. So even if you don't like that specific piece of work that you've made, um, and you shouldn't compare yourself to others, by the way, but even if you like, you don't like that specific work you've made, there's always an opportunity to incorporate the skills that you've learned making that work into future work. It just reminds me of journalism. Like sometimes I think of some articles I've written and I cringe. Like, I was reading back, I think it was a few weeks ago, I was reading back one of my old articles. It's terrible. It's awful. But I don't feel bad about it because I needed to go through that and write so many more articles even after that one to get to the point I'm at now, to the point that I can actually realise that my writing back then was awful. It's like, oh my God, it was so bad. So I think that's kind of like the silver lining that you can look through. But I think also just don't compare yourself to others because I think a lot of times we compare ourselves to people that are at a different stage in their career or life to us and we want to be on that same level, but it's like we haven't put in the hours. Um, so yeah, that's my advice. Now this question is, what's your opinion on Walter Benjamin? Um, so I'm guessing what, by Walter Benjamin, you mean like the German philosopher Walter Benjamin. Now, I don't really have a massive opinion on Walter Benjamin. Obviously, I know he's a very famous German philosopher. I've read one of his books, The Work of Age, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. 
amazing book, so good. It's it's so good because it's it was written so many years ago, but it's so it's even more relevant to the world we are in today. However, I've talked about that book so many times and I haven't read any other of his works. So I've never really had like a massive Walter Benjamin opinion apart from the book I've read. But if anyone here watching this has any more recommendations to any of his essays or any of his books he's written, then definitely let me know because I'd love to read it. Well, the next question is, when Maria Grazia leaves Dior, do you th who do you think will be the most suited successor? This is actually a really good question. I've never actually thought about this. Now, the reason why I've never actually thought about this question is because everyone always like hates on Maria Grazia Turi and everyone says that they don't like her and they don't think she's a good designer and all that stuff. But I know for a fact she is doing so well financially at Dior and because she's doing well financially, money talks and they're not gonna get rid of her because at the end of the day, she's there so that they can sell clothes and if that's what she's doing, she's doing her job well in the eyes of the people that matter, that basically hire her. Um, and so I've never just even considered when she leaves the York because I think she's just going to be there for so long. Um, but I think Claire White Keller would be a good replacement because I like Claire White Keller's aesthetic. Obviously it didn't work at Givenchy, financially, whatever, but I think Dior is just a different thing. It's very hard for it not to work at Dior because it's it's a bigger brand than Givenchy, it's a bigger name than Givenchy, more people know about Dior than Givenchy, um, and there's just more things you can play with at Dior, and I think her aesthetic would work. She's shown that she can design really good uh, haute couture collections, which is not something that a lot of designers presently can say. Um, so I think Claire White Keller would be like a really good person that um, could design at Dior. Um, but to add context to the whole Maria Grazia Turi thing, if you don't know who she is, she's the current creative director of Dior, and that's Christine Dior, which is the women's wear um, side of Dior. Obviously the men's wear side, Dior Homme, is run by Kim, well not run, but the artistic director is Kim Jones. Um, and so she, I think she started at Fendi, and she worked at Fendi as an accessories designer. She was kind of under the team of Silvia Venturini Fendi. Silvia Ven Venturini Fendi, obviously from the Fendi family, she's known famously for designing the baguette bag. But as it is with fashion, yes, Silvia Venturini gets all the credit, but it wasn't just her in her room. She just designed this bag. Like she had a whole team, which included Maria Garza Churi and many other people to make this bag, right? And then I think she moved to Valentino as an accessories designer, then she eventually worked her way up into the role of co-creative director. And she was, Maria Gotti was a co-creative director with Pio Paolo, who's still the creative director at Valentino. And then she eventually moved to Dior. And everyone on social media, like you've probably seen if you're like interested in fashion, everyone bashes her work. Like for some reason, no one likes her work. Everyone thinks she's a terrible designer. I don't think she's a terrible designer. There's a lot of her work that I definitely enjoy and I like, but there are some criticisms that I've always had for her work. One of the criticisms is a big theme in a lot of her work and a lot of her collections is feminism. And so in every collection, it's inspired by a woman that was an artist or a feminism movement or some, there's always some sort of thing about feminism and women's empowerment um, incorporated into her collections. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. As a woman, it's amazing. You want to empower other women. I just think there's a contradiction in the fact that your collections are about feminism and your creative director of Dior, which is a brand under the LVMH umbrella. And who is the main person at LVMH? It's Bernard Arnault, which is a man. So ultimately, whatever you sell to women, under the, you know, inspiration of feminism, the money is ultimately going to Bernard Arnault, which is a man. So that's already like, kind of like a contradiction there. It's not really about, you're not empowering women by buying those Dior pieces that are about women's empowerment, if that makes sense. And I think if you're a woman and you want to invest in a brand that is about women's empowerment, I think it's better to invest in a woman-owned brand, not Dior, that's owned by a man. So that's obviously one side. 
The other side is her feminism is so white and European, it's crazy, considering that Dior is a global brand. And so she's had collections that she's been, um, you know, criticized for, where all the models are white. And she's had collections where she talks about how, I don't think it was her that said it, I think it was someone from her press team, but there was this specific collection, I think it was a couture collection, that all the models were white and the inspiration was some like Greek mythology thing. And I don't think she personally said that, so definitely not a knock on her, but someone from the press team mistakenly said, and that person definitely needs to be fired, that person said that, oh, they wanted it to be, you know, true to the inspiration of the collection, which is fine if that's linear across your collection. So if you're having a collection that's inspired by Greek mythology, cool, all the models are white, cool, because in ancient Greece, everyone was white, cool, good on you. However, she had a cruise collection where there were African prints featured and the theme of that was all about Africa and yet there are white models on that runway. So then that point doesn't make, it doesn't hold any weight and it doesn't make sense because you can't on one collection be like, yeah, we wanted it to be true. So there's just a lot of stuff that she does. It's just like a big contradiction. A lot of what she does is just a whole contradiction. And then in terms of silhouettes that she designs, she overuses Dior's bar suit. And I understand that when you're a creative director of a brand, you have to reference the work of the originator of the brand. In this case, it would be Kristen Dior. So we always see the flowers all the time. And we see like rehashes basically of a lot of old of, a lot of Dior's old work, which we see, but it's also good to innovate. Like when John Galliano was at Dior, he made the saddlebag, which Kristen Dior didn't make a saddlebag, did he? It was literally just, a new interpretation that John Galliano made and I'd like to see more innovation in that sense because one of the big reasons why Maria Gatsu Churi was doing well financially was because she brought back John Galliano's saddlebag and then changed different aspects to it, made like longer straps, made bigger versions, smaller versions, all that sort of stuff and I'm like okay that's cool that you were selling really well doing that but also you didn't make the saddlebag. So it's like, where's the innovation? You're creating all these different iterations of the basu, but at some point you have to innovate. And I've never understood that because the designers that created these brands, like a Christian Dior, he was, let's not say a complete innovator because a lot of what he did, Cristobal Balenciaga did it before him and other designers did it before Christian Dior himself. And then also Isla Laurent was, heavily influencing a lot of Christian Dior's designs. But there was a lot of innovation in the sense that a lot of the stuff that we saw from Dior, when we saw it, other people weren't doing. And so I don't know why brands these days, instead of using that same mentality and trying to create new things, they just go, oh, I, I reference this collection, I reference that collection. It just happens all the time. So I think those are my main criticisms of Maria Grazia Turi's work. Um, that being said, I don't think she's a bad designer. You don't become the creative director of Christian Dior being a bad designer. She has a very proven track record from Fendi to Valentino to Dior. She's a heavily accomplished designer. Um, I just think that that whole idea that Maria Gotta Turi is a bad designer, I think it's just social media narrative. And once a narrative is formed, people are not even going to look into the collection. They're just going to see the clothing and be like, what can I pick out that's terrible so I can put it on social media and keep dragging this narrative that Maria Grazia Churi is a bad designer? I think that's what happens. And I think most of the people that you ask, why is Maria Grazia Churi a bad designer? A lot of people won't be able to tell you. It's this idea, and I've talked about this before, a lot of people in fashion feel like to prove that you know a lot about fashion, you have to have this sort of like mean, bitchy, sassy opinion about things. And that sort of shows that you're like a fashion person. I think some people think that to be in fashion, you have to have this like devil wears Prada mean mentality and mean demeanor. And there are definitely a lot of people that are in the fashion industry that I'm thinking off the top of my head that are like that. Um, but that doesn't, being mean doesn't mean your point holds any more weight or that you actually know what you're talking about. But yeah, that was a really good question. I'll put some information about Dior's financial reports on the screen just to show how well Maria Gatsia Turi and just Dior in general are doing financially, which is why 
she'll be there for a really long time. But yeah, it was really fun answering these questions. I like doing these Q&A questions. I might do another one because there were way more questions that were sent in. I just thought to answer these few ones in this video. So if you want me to make like a part two or a part three, definitely comment down below. Comment your general thoughts about all of the questions that I discussed in this video and I'll be back with another video very soon. Thank you very much for watching.